Good evening and welcome to Have I Got News For You. I'm Victoria Corin mitchell In the news this week, as this year's Chelsea Flower Show gets underway, Alan Titchmarsh perfects his cunning plan to get in without paying. <laughs> Citizens of the United States are shocked to discover there are worse things you can do to the American flag than burn it. <laughs> and round the back of Downing Street, cabinet ministers go to extreme lengths to get a meeting with Theresa May. Ian's team tonight is a comedian whose latest show deals with the eternal question of what we experience after death. Presumably a blessed relief from Brexit. <laughs> Please welcome Ahir Shah. <laughs> and with Paul tonight is a Labour MP who's been described as one of the two funniest people at Westminster. And before that goes to her head, the other one was Philip Hammond. <laughs> <laughs> Please welcome Jess Phillips MP. And we start with the bigger stories of the week. Ian and here, take a look at this. Well, that's the former Prime Minister. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the Parliament. Committee, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's the Queen. <laughs> no, that's Andrea Leadsom. Oh, God. Uh... At time of recording, who's Prime Minister? Uh, Boris Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> it, is, it is currently Theresa May. Oh, right, of course. Yeah, but how bad have things got for Theresa May? There's been another cabinet revolt. She won't even see her main ministers. She's now got a, a cabinet of two, herself and her husband. Uh, <laughs> even he's walking out. Uh, everyone's gone. Andrea Leadsom's gone, you saw there. Do you know what number Andrea Leadsom is on the resignation list under Theresa May? How many have gone? 36. She's the 36th minister. There's a, there's a graph from the BBC. A graph on a comedy show? This is the <laughs> <laughs> This is a graph of ministerial resignations before Theresa May, and here it is with Theresa May on it. <laughs> We're at the stage where Andrea Leadsom is described as a heavy hitter. <laughs> she was a joke five minutes ago. <laughs> like, she had that terrible rally. Do you remember, like, Tim Lighton in the street being like, Andrea Leadsom, Andrea Leadsom, and everyone was like, God, what a joke, and now it's like, Andrea Leadsom? She wouldn't be that bad. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go for Andrea Leadsom. But have people forgotten that Andrea Leadsom said that Theresa May couldn't really be Prime Minister because she hadn't had children? Yeah, as if Theresa May, because she, like, had never evacuated her womb, would definitely take us to nuclear war. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that definitely follows. I mean, you're more likely to want to press the big button if you have got kids, I think. <laughs> <laughs> They're not a massive pain in the arse. Shall we have a look at Andrea Leadsom's resignation letter? Yeah, absolutely. What, wow. a jolly, what a jolly pen she's gone for. <laughs> Do you remember anything she said in the letter, particularly? She said she'd just noticed the Prime Minister wasn't up to much. <laughs> My favourite line in the letter was, no-one has wanted you to succeed more than I have. <laughs> <laughs> if Andrea Leadsom stands again, she's presumably going to have to represent her CV. I don't want to bring up, you know, unpleasant things, but... Last time, it did appear to have been slightly embellished. <laughs> this time, she's going to claim that she had been Prime Minister for the last three years. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we see some footage of Andrea Leadsom on the day she resigned? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Is she on a bike? Well, no. No, but she could have been. It does involve transport. Let's ah, go him. Well, I'm looking very carefully at the legislation today as leader of the Commons. That's my job, and making sure that it delivers Brexit. Thanks very much. The man is waiting. Do you think they know each other? No, I do. I think he's an opportunist. <laughs> Sees her on the telly, he lives next door, right, I'm out here. <laughs> he's doing that every day and never gets a kiss, but every so often it happens. <laughs> and how are the 1922 committee trying to encourage Theresa May to leave? They did a rap. <laughs> <laughs> They're trying to change their rules, uh, which say you can only get a challenge once a year. And they want um, to do it weekly now. Yeah. <laughs> When is something going to happen? What, generally, in politics? Yeah. Yeah. I think by October, the, something will have happened. I'm not saying it'll be great, but uh, <laughs> something will have happened. Do they slash you understand it needs to be complete electoral reform? Somebody came round yes. to our house canvassing 
for the Conservatives before these elections. And they said, are you going to vote Conservative? And I said, but what does that even mean? Do you mean centrist, wet Matthew Paris sort of Conservative? Do you mean Brexit Conservative? Do you mean this sort of hard line? And she laughed and said, I don't know, everyone's asking the same thing. <laughs> British politics has desperately let down the country. No leadership whatsoever. It's a total disgrace. I've literally got nothing funny to say about it. It's really depressing, but just imagine if it was your job every single day. <laughs> <laughs> we need people to come together. You yeah. to do that. OK, I'll crack on with that. Good. <laughs> you don't need different new parties or... You just need something to believe in. I admire you personally enormously, so it's That's not a personal kind of thing. You. Say more but things yeah. like that. They've to be honest, already... I think she was talking to me, then. <laughs> <laughs> It all kicked off at a press conference on Tuesday. Mm. How did Theresa May begin her speech there? Hell! <laughs> <laughs> sort of the opposite. She told assembled reporters, it's a great time to be alive. <laughs> <laughs> what have people said about Theresa May's EU deal? I think the plan is still to vote on it on the first week back after recess. Uh, yeah, cos you don't get much holiday. <laughs> And start this. I bet you get much more holiday than me, and I bet no one rings you and asks you where the bin collection is while you're on the beach. I've been doing that to Ian for quite some time. <laughs> just <as> a... <laughs> what do you think Theresa May's big mistake has been in her approach to the negotiation? Entering right? politics. <laughs> <laughs> Particularly with the EU negotiation. Um, I don't know, didn't she? Well, I've no idea. <laughs> <laughs> but she's tried to compromise with all sides, hasn't she? Would you say, Ian, that there's a sort of uncanny parallel with the failure of the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V <laughs> to unify the Catholics and the Lutherans at the Colloquy of Regensburg? No, you mention it, you're spot on. <laughs> <laughs> Too few people have pointed that out. I bet Jacob Rees-Mogg pointed it out. <laughs> <laughs> But nobody wants a, a compromise now in the Conservative Party, do they? Because no. there's a leadership but race. But nobody wants a compromise. I mean, the Parliament has not actually voted for anything that is possible to achieve, has it? No, it hasn't Apart from no anything. deal. That's the only thing you've agreed. And it won by one vote. And apparently the Tories had somebody stuck on a train. They were gutted. That's true. Is it Chris Grayling? <laughs> God, I <hope> <laughs> <so>. <laughs> Better be stuck under a train. <laughs> <laughs> Is Boris Johnson going to be Prime Minister? No. Front winner never wins in the Tories. That's all I can say you can cling to for hope. If you're watching, <laughs> if you're watching the repeat and he is Prime Minister, I'm really sorry. <laughs> <laughs> what about his potential running mate, what's been said there? Who's his running mate? Well, who do they say it will be? I didn't know they'd said anyone. I didn't know anyone could run alongside him. I mean, it's just one man show. Well, the talk has been that he'll have as a running partner Amber Rudd. She would never do it, surely to God. <laughs> well, I feel like texting do? her right now. Yeah. <laughs> Amber, have you been considering a job share with Satan? <laughs> <laughs> she might have been hoping to swing voters back to the Conservatives with the Euro elections. Obviously, we don't know the results. I think I'm going to go right ahead and assume that they've gone terribly. For who? For... That's appalling bias. <laughs> <laughs> I think that they'll have gone terribly for slightly fewer than half of the people. <laughs> yeah. And extremely well for slightly more than half of the people right. as we continue this exercise in what happens when an entire country decides to walk directly into a lamppost and then try and style it out. <laughs> Do you think, Jess, that by the time the polls close, Jeremy Corbyn will have revealed what he thinks about <laughs> Europe? Very unlikely, isn't it, really, that he'll ever re re reveal it, I don't think. Do you think he wants it in or out? That sounds wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Shake it all about, I think, is what he's after. Do you think he wants to be in Europe or out? I think he wants to be out of Europe, to be perfectly honest. I feel as though the Labour Party's policy is still, to this day, we have a Brexit plan, but you don't know her, she goes to another school. <laughs> <laughs> uh, here's an Irish politician campaigning in the Euro elections on Twitter. He's quite clear what he wants to do. Let's have a look. People are asking why I carry a hurley stick. 
Folks, elections are no more about between left and right. It's between right and wrong, good and evil. And we are really troubled in this country with state corruption. That's one of the things I intend to take care of if I come back here with the office of MEP. If I come back with MEP office, that's going. Vote number one, Ben Gilroy for Europe. And I'm going to Europe to get our money back. <laughs> Uh, can I just ask why you've applauded that? <laughs> Probably need to say, by the way, because there's still 45 minutes left before the polls close in Dublin, and the other 18 candidates, I'm sure, could all also break a plasterboard with a stick. <laughs> <laughs> and let's go back to why the audience applauded. You thought that's the kind of strong leadership we need? <laughs> None of this hopeless attempt at compromise. Bloke with a big stick whacking thing. <laughs> well, I tell you what, if you like a strong leader, who said this recently? I'll don khaki, pick up a rifle, and head for the front lines to defend Brexit. Some prick. <laughs> <laughs> Is that Mark Francois fits that description. It wasn't Mark Francois. No, it was Farage. Oh, it some prick. Farage. <laughs> and what's he been wearing recently, Nigel Farage? Milkshake. <laughs> Shall we have a look at the moment where it all went wrong? Good advert for Waterstones there, though, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and for milkshakes. Fundamental difference between us and American culture, really. The President Kennedy, Nigel Farage. <laughs> <laughs> Why milkshake? Why is that the thing people throw? It's, it makes a mess, doesn't it? Well, there was a time where people were saying eggs could hurt. You know, yes. when Prescott hit, was hit yes. one. I mean, an egg might hurt, whereas a milkshake's just... It's just a milkshake. Yeah. I reckon it's because the Ramonas are in the pockets of Big Dairy. <laughs> <laughs> it does give the impression that he's Rosetta's spouting milk. <laughs> <laughs> he also just said he was going to don khakis and go over and fight uh, on the beaches. He was, you know, whinging about a milkshake. He, he wouldn't oh, have him yeah, on the but, front line. Oh, yeah, but, yeah, but he be, might be being unfair. He might be lactose intolerant. <laughs> <laughs> he's intolerant, generally. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Other candidates of the milkshake attack trend include the UKIP MEP candidate, Carl Benjamin. Are you familiar with that gentleman, Jess? Yeah, I'm familiar with the neckbeard that is Carl Benjamin. <laughs> no, I don't think that you should throw things at politicians. I don't think that you should attack them. I think you should win by being better than them, which is what I am currently doing to Carl Benjamin. Um, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> What I find absolutely fascinating about this whole furore over the milkshake is, of course, yes, you shouldn't attack people, but McDonald's stopped selling milkshakes because they were posing a threat to far-right hate preachers. And yet the videos of this man talking about whether he would or wouldn't rape me remain on YouTube to this day. So we are massively over-egging this particular pudding <laughs> about the milkshakes. Let's take a look at the controversial notice put up in a McDonald's in Edinburgh during a Brexit rally earlier this week. We will not be selling milkshakes or ice cream tonight. This is due to a police request Honestly. given recent events. That's even worse. It's the police it's, telling them I mean, not to sell it. It is just... That but it's only milkshakes. And you could possibly go in and buy a McFlurry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> say ice creams. Well, and also, Burger King was still selling milkshakes. This is what they tweeted. Dear people of Scotland, <laughs> we're selling milkshakes all weekend. <laughs> Love BK. <laughs> this is the news that, at time of recording, Theresa May is clinging on to her premiership. According to one senior minister, Mrs May is refusing to budge from her planned commitments. The sofa is up against the door. But eventually the Queen will have to let her in for their regular meeting. <laughs> <laughs> It's not been a great week for Theresa May. In fact, tonight, she and Philip had booked a table for two at Jamie's Italian. <laughs> the BBC was forced to apologise this week after, in an interview, Vince Cable used the word bollocks. To be fair, he's a very old man and Andrew Marr was accidentally <laughs> standing on one of them. <laughs> Paul and Jess, have a look at this. OK, so there's a couple dining out, like it's uh, uh, Jamie Oliver, who we've just mentioned. Yes, he's... Um, restaurants are all shutting. All restaurants are all shutting down. Um, <laughs> Jamie Oliver's restaurants have closed. They've gone into receivership. 
I believe. That's it. Jamie Oliver blamed the company's collapse on the well-publicised struggles of the casual dining sector and decline of the UK high street, along with soaring business rates. How do you think the Sunday Times food critic, Marina O'Loughlin, described Jamie's tagliatelle? Presumably not in complimentary terms. Load of old shit. <laughs> Almost exactly so. Yeah. <laughs> she described the tagliatelle with truffles at the Jamie's in Westfield Stratford as a honking, salty swamp of a sauce, brown and dusty with nutmeg. Tiny chunks, not shavings, a tasteless black truffle lurk around like mouse poos in soup. <laughs> brown and dusty with nutmeg is my Tinder bio. <laughs> <laughs> What did Peter Shilton have to say on the matter? I mean, I don't know how we ever cave unless we know what Peter Shilton... <laughs> <laughs> one time, goalkeeper's got to say. He said it was a shame because it was always somewhere you'd like to go on a Friday night where you could get a decent meal and not be bothered by people. Yeah, well, <laughs> in a way, yes. <laughs> Peter Shilton... I know Peter Shilton's mind. <laughs> <laughs> I can read it. Peter Shilton posted a sympathetic tweet. Sorry to hear Jamie Oliver restaurants have gone into liquidation. I went with my wife and grandkids to one and I had a steak with a sauce I specially requested, which was great. So that's nice. Jamie will appreciate that, Peter. That's lovely. But he added, but the kids had pasta, which they loved, but couldn't eat as it was so bad. <laughs> <laughs> what recent trend may have affected the business, according to the food writer William Sitwell? More people getting food delivered? He said, the cost of dining has persuaded more people to cook at home and flirt with meal kits. Mm. What's a meal kit? It's what posh people who think that they've got no time get um, a load of stuff delivered to their door with, like, the right amount of spices in and then, like, pretend that they're really good at cooking because they just put it, things in together that had arrived on their door. It's a massive waste and a total nonsense. Well, that is new. I thought a meal kit was a tin and a tin opener. <laughs> <laughs> Can you still get truffles in tins? <laughs> <laughs> when did you last open a tin, for God's sake? <laughs> Ordinary remark to make on public television. What did one member of staff accidentally serve to diners in a Manchester this oh, week? Oh, expensive, very expensive bottle of wine. How like expensive? A, oh, like, I don't know, like £3,000 or something like that? Even £4,500. Yes. Diners at the Hawksmoor restaurant, they'd ordered a, a bottle of red wine. It was quite expensive, they yeah. were given that. According to the Times, the error wasn't spotted until it had already been partially drunk. I bet they necked the rest pretty quickly. Yeah. <laughs> the owner of the restaurant tweeted, to the member of staff who accidentally gave it away, chin up. Oh. One-off mistakes happen and we love you anyway. Adding, goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> when people online questioned who would pay £4,500 for a bottle of wine, the steakhouse replied, in this case, quite literally <laughs> no-one. <laughs> <laughs> who dropped in to help Sainsbury's celebrate their 150th anniversary? Queen. It was the Queen. Should we have oh, a look? Was it? Oh, yeah. Queen went and did like a self service checkout. It, well, she, well, she wasn't in the six items or less thing. <laughs> so, do anything nice for the weekend? Let's see the Queen in the supermarket. I love the fact that was her first reaction. Yeah. <laughs> she saw through the system. Yeah. <laughs> to be fair, that's how she got the koh noor by putting it through as a courgette. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love the Queen, but that's just like anybody would think. Everybody, when you she, first yes. use it, you think, one for me, one for you. <laughs> what was Ryan Thomas from Cardiff stunned to discover in his shopping? The Queen, the guy had accidentally put her through <laughs> as well. So? His first wife. <laughs> <laughs> He bought a pouch of amber leaf tobacco, only to find it contained a slice of bread. Here it is. <laughs> what did Ryan tell the Daily Mirror his first thought was? Why well, have I got bread in my... <laughs> <laughs> Are you seriously saying this became... This was a news story? <laughs> yes. Man finds bread in tobacco pouch. Yes, I, I mean, it was... The news reported that his first thought was, this is actually bread. <laughs> <laughs> He went back to the Tesco Express. Yeah, you would. Where You'd he be angry, it, yes. You? And, right. and, and what did he find inside his replacement pouch of tobacco? Uh, Slice of cheese. <laughs> <laughs> On returning to the same store, he was given another pack of tobacco. I said, "Do you mind if I open it here?" And I opened it, and it was the crust. <laughs> <laughs> What's behind this? What was going on? It was somebody trapped in a tobacco factory, and they were smuggling out messages in bread. <laughs> Apparently, this could be the work of criminal gangs. 
because tobacco has quite high value, mm -hmm. so they steal tobacco in large quantities and put bread in the packet because it feels the same. I'm terrified now. <laughs> what other bad news was there for the UK last weekend? Your vision. Um, how did we get on? I didn't see it, but I understand really we, bad. We, came, we came last. We came last. Do you know how many points we got? Four. It was like 21 or something. It was 16. But it was wrong, wasn't it? Then wasn't there was a recount it? and yeah. five points were removed. <laughs> Madonna was terrible, wasn't she? Oh, dreadful. Do you watch the Eurovision Song Contest? Of course. Do you? Yeah. Oh, I'm really glad. I, I would really have imagined that you'd be watching system. something on BBC Four at the same time. Oh, no, no, because all their documentaries don't go out. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you, you saw Madonna singing like a prayer. Yeah, well, I thought it was going to be brilliant, and then she opened her mouth. <laughs> would you like to hear it again? Yes, I would. Life is a mystery. Everyone must stand alone. I hear you call my name, and it feels right. Oh. I felt sorry for her. I thought she wasn't singing very well because she'd hurt her eye. <laughs> Did you watch this? Oh, I, I literally love it. It's my favourite thing in the whole year. It's better than any election. It is the best thing ever. I love it. Did you vote for any of them? I didn't vote this year because, actually, I didn't think any of them were quite up to the standard that I've come to expect, and I think that the Netherlands... <laughs> you didn't vote? I didn't vote. I did vote in today's election. <laughs> <laughs> an in obvious yesterday's question to election. Now. Oh, yeah, sorry, in yesterday's <laughs> election. There was an election yesterday as well. <laughs> <laughs> this is the demise of Jamie's Italian. Trying to explain the collapse of the restaurant chain, the manager of one Jamie's Italian said, things are fairly hard. I think he means al dente. <laughs> <laughs> one person affected by the collapse of Jamie's Italian was former England goalkeeper Peter Shilton, <laughs> who tweeted that he did join us. Of Peter Shilton. <laughs> <laughs> One person affected by the collapse of Jamie's Italian was former England goalkeeper Peter Shilton, who tweeted that he'd enjoyed a steak there, but his grandchildren had pasta, which they loved but couldn't eat as it was so bad. Mind you, Peter Shilton's never liked tagliatelle, linguine, or ravioli, as they all scored against him at Italia 90. <laughs> also, this week it was announced that British Steel is going into liquidation, putting more than 5,000 jobs at risk. It never rains, but it pours. They just clinched the deal to supply the cutlery for Jamie's Italian. <laughs> <laughs> and so to round two, the jigsaw of news. Buzz when you know what it is. Paul and Jess. That's an emu. <laughs> and it's on the run in Scotland. It's been seen in Aberdeen, Perth and Dundee. It runs at about 35 miles an hour and nobody can catch it. They can't, uh, they can't try to put a saddle on it. Uh, <laughs> the Archbishop of Edinburgh has been lowered down on a helicopter to try and get onto his back. <laughs> so, essentially, that's what it is. Do you know its name? Uh, Louis. He's, <laughs> he's one half of a duo oh. of emus named Bonnie and Clyde. And it's Clyde. Where did Clyde escape from? A zoo in Edinburgh or somebody's house. It was a petting zoo at a care home in the Scottish village of Ecclefecken. <laughs> which I think is actually what the zookeeper muttered when he found the emu was gone. Yeah. <laughs> What's Eckel Fecken renowned for? Its inability to cage wild birds. <laughs> Tarts. Thank you, pardon? <laughs> <laughs> the Eckel Fecken Tart is a sort of open top mince pie oh, which yeah. originates from Eckel Fecken. Clyde is not the first emu to go on the run in Scotland recently. Would you like to see an emu running along the A82? Yeah, is it oh. Julian Assange, the emu? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I don't think I would, actually. <laughs> On this. Yeah, we should have a vote. Who wants to see an emu running down the road? <laughs> Everybody. <laughs> Everybody. All right, All right quick look at the emu. <laughs> <laughs> Where was it going? We know there's a coyote behind it. <laughs> <laughs> Where was it going? Well, I don't know, whichever way that road is. Aberdeen. Well, it was a trick question because I didn't tell you which way along the A82 it was going. It was going away from Loch Ness towards Glasgow. <laughs> <laughs> Are you auditioning some new quiz format? <laughs> <laughs> What's Elton John done to upset donkeys this week? 
Is he, is he, is he charging less for rides on Blackpool Beach? <laughs> He submitted planning permission oh, yeah. to demolish the stables he built for his two donkeys, which, according to the Times, he's going to replace with a recording studio. I mean, good luck getting a tune out of them. <laughs> Have you seen Elton's donkey stable? No. What do you think it looks like? It looks like a Tudor farmhouse. Basically, yes. Windsor Castle. Here it is. <laughs> Even donkeys have a greater prospect of home ownership than I do. <laughs> <laughs> It is exactly 42 years since the monster of Ickham Pond was terrorising locals by eating all the fish. How do they deal with that beast? <laughs> did they get Peter Shilton in? <laughs> they called in the army. Should we have a look? The army moved in at 1,400 hours. For the sappers, this was the big one. With a ferret scout car, frogmen and eight high-explosive charges, Boy soldiers of the Junior Leaders Regiment, Royal Engineers, prepared to deal with the monster of Ickham Pond. <coughs> Mr Leggett's garden was cleared for a countdown. One, two, one, fire! <laughs> <laughs> Shall we see the defeated monster? Yeah. yeah. Here it is. <laughs> <laughs> this is the surprising news about an emu... Well, why on earth were we watching <laughs> that? <laughs> From 42 years ago. <laughs> Oh, just to remind us of the days when we had an army. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> this is the surprising news about an emu at a petting zoo in Scotland. The emu was spotted running down the A82 at 25 miles an hour, but was still overtaken by a local man who realised he'd left his change on the table and a little chef in the Trossachs. <laughs> Elton John's fake castle was built to accommodate two donkeys and two Shetland ponies. Here they are. Of course, they were horses until Elton sat on them. <laughs> <laughs> Fingers on buzzers, teams. Here's another one. Paul and Jess. This is uh, Amazon and these sort of voice recognition systems that use uh, female voices, and some people have complained that this might be a sexist, stereotypical thing because women, as the stereotype might go, are always telling men what to do. Or is it something like that? Is it that the sort of well, idea the behind it? I mean, the, the report from UNESCO says that the default female voice normalises the idea that women are subservient, docile helpers that are available at the touch of a button. I do know, I mean, you know, with the satellite nav uh, that most people now have in their cars, when they first came out about 15 years ago, the research showed that most men didn't want to do what a man was telling them. That's Mine's what... Snoop Doggy Dog. Is it? My sat nav. Yeah. How'd you get him to do that? <laughs> <laughs> He's not got a lot on, really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 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 and he knows the Birmingham area really well. <laughs> he really <laughs> does. <laughs> I think it's a load of rubbish, people being upset about whether it's a man or a woman's voice, really. Yeah, I don't honest. think the worst problem of sexism in the modern era no. is that Siri speaks with a female voice. No. no. It's actually a male voice in this country anyway, but... How did the researchers test their theory that Siri is sexist? They got a few beards in. Said a few random words, and when they woke up, they agreed it was sexist. <laughs> well, it wasn't random words. They repeatedly shouted at Siri, you're a slut. <laughs> to which right. Siri meekly replied, I'd blush if I could. <laughs> I mean, S Siri does need to sort that out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what voice does your Siri have? You've got the voice of Gladstone on yours. <laughs> I'm afraid that hasn't yet been invented, sir. <laughs> I would like that. Mm. Doesn't it just sit there all day just listening to you and then telling Amazon? Yep. The, yeah, the yep. proper smart speakers are really terrifying. Like, it just shows how much more amenable people would have been to the Stasi if you could have asked the Stasi to play Despacito on command. <laughs> 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 it definitely listens to you all day and then push market to you. Like, yes. if you say, like, I've got my period, then you get loads of Tampax things on your uh, Facebook. It de it's just fine on your... Why, why do you have to tell that? That it's no, your period. No, but I don't tell it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like talking about it with my mates, or we're we'll talking don't about needing new tights or something, and it's listening, and then it's Why trying to it sell listening? me like tights and like Botox. It's constantly trying to sell me Botox. As <laughs> well, long as it's not just noticed you being grumpy and gone, I bet she's got her period. <laughs> <laughs> And what happened this week to, to show that things haven't changed quite as much as they might have done? Oh, there was a female producer who didn't take the job that she was offered because she was found that she was getting £12,000 less than a man who was doing exactly the same job. That's right. Karen Martin, a BBC News producer, was offered the job of deputy editor for the BBC Radio Newsroom, and a man was also offered it, and she was offered £12,000 less. Uh, even though, as she said in her email explaining why she was turning it down, they were offered the same job on the same day after the same board during the same recruitment process. Will the BBC never learn? How many times do we have to say? 
Pay us the same as people with balls. <laughs> Thank God, Jess, that you and I are both getting 20 grand for this appearance. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's right, isn't it? Like, <laughs> You've got other things against you that means they wouldn't pay you as well. <laughs> <laughs> We're in this together, Flower. <laughs> What has recent research revealed about the female characters in Game of Thrones? Oh, they don't have as much dialogue as the men. The female characters speak for only 25% of the time. Mm -hmm. And if you look across all eight seasons, even dead male characters are given more dialogue than female characters <laughs> who survive at the end. I've never seen... I understand it's sort of topless women and creatures running about. It used yeah. to be a lot more shagging and fighting. And then... And it's disappointing that it's less and then it became, it? Yeah, <laughs> to be honest, it got a bit disappointing. And then it became, like, about council meetings and then about dragons. <laughs> Is it about bins? And then in the last one... <laughs> in the last one, it became about council meetings again. Yeah, the bins of Westeros. Is it twice an era, once an era? <laughs> Does anyone know what prize was given to the female winners at the Asturias Squash Championships in northern Spain? An actual squash? Like a butternut squash. <laughs> In a way, yes. <laughs> a Durex vibrator. <laughs> yes. It's sort of a mechanical version of the squash. Uh, <laughs> that was, um, the women were delighted. Let's have a look at the delighted winners. <laughs> How did feminist champions the Daily Star... Oh, it's, the, it's the game squash. The game squash? Yes. <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> What's been going on? What, what have you been thinking about? <laughs> he, he was talking about squash, the fruit, yeah, the, the a, vegetable. As a, like, you know, like, as a joke. <laughs> I'm terribly sorry. I was making the <laughs> mistake of taking you seriously. <laughs> I, w I will stop at once. Yes, of course. The Daily Star covered the story with a sense of outrage, uh, but it was slightly undermined by where they put the story. <laughs> it's Bonnie. <laughs> 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 As in Bonnie and Clyde. <laughs> <laughs> that emu's done well for himself. <laughs> done very well. <laughs> Time now for the odd one out round. It's just one between you this week. Jacob Rees-Mogg, Steve Bruce, David Cameron and E.L. James. I think this is about books. Jacob Rees-Mogg has just written a book about the Victorians, which was very, very badly reviewed. Which was very satisfying. Which was, yes, but, but fair, I thought. A number of people said it was the worst book ever written by anyone on any subject, which I thought was <laughs> a good, sensible, balanced review. Um, so, anyway, he's produced a book. David Cameron's book's finally appearing. Mm -hmm. This one was delayed for ages, cos it wouldn't be a good time, what with Brexit and everything. <laughs> And in the end, the publishers thought, well, we might as well publish it now. It's always a bad time. <laughs> E.L. James has a new book. Who is E.L. James? E.L. James wrote Fifty Shades of Grey. Um, and the sequels thereof. Steve Bruce... I Who's Steve Bruce? Steve Bruce is a football manager. Association football is a sport. <laughs> <laughs> They've all written a book, apart from David Cameron, whose book is going to come out and he's been working on it for ages. Together, you've got the right answer. They've all got terrible book reviews. Yes. Yeah. Apart from David Cameron, whose book isn't out yet, but people are already being mean. Right. It's right. going to be called For the Record. That's right. And what sort of reception has his book had already? Bad. Very bad. Everybody's been really narky about it and said it's going to be awful. One Twitter user said, I believe the audiobook version features someone sobbing. <laughs> While another said, Will the hardback come without a spine as well? <laughs> And you mentioned Ian Jacob Rees-Mogg's book on the Victorians. Do you know what Dominic Sandbrook in The Times said about that? Um, no, but please okay. quote it. He said it was staggeringly silly, absolutely abysmal, and Rees-Mogg is a man with all the wit, style and literary elan of a Bulgarian boiler salesman. <laughs> Steve Bruce, the football manager, mm. writes niche crime novels. Cool. He's written three. Here's the first one. Striker. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that's an enormously big player. <laughs> it revolves around fictional football manager Steve Barnes, <laughs> who's investigating the kidnapping of the club's janitor. Would you like to hear some of Bruce's work? Here's an extract from Stryker. <laughs> Our hero Steve Barnes is being taken at gunpoint to a secluded hillside. Mm. Fearing imminent death, he muses, I could make out the reservoirs made to provide water to the big cities of Lancashire. These reservoirs, dotted everywhere in hidden valleys, are themselves fed with water from upland streams. 
The previous summer had been a wet one, and the streams were torrents still. In order to facilitate the collection of this hill water, the authorities, the water board, had constructed concrete watercourses. These allowed faster and more efficient collection of rainwater. <laughs> oh, for God's sake, just shoot him already. <laughs> It's a lot better written than E.L. James's book. <laughs> yes, why has her book been criticised, her latest one? It's disappointingly good. No, apparently no, it's not it very isn't. good. Is it not sexy? Because the previous ones were sexy, so maybe people are like, this isn't sexy. Well, I tell you what, we'll have a look at the cover, I'll tell you the plot, and you tell me if you think it's sexy. That's a nice cover. <laughs> it's, quite a it's quite a sedate image, isn't it, for a sexy mm. book? Just mm. the river... Doesn't look very sexy, does nice it? Trees. It revolves around Albanian cleaner Alessia Damacci who is a concert-level pianist and chess grandmaster with synesthesia. What? The I newspaper's Cat Brown summed it up by saying, you will laugh a lot during this book, <laughs> not in a good way. <laughs> um, <laughs> Fifty Shades of Grey is genuinely one of the funniest books I've ever read. I have only read uh, the first one and I gave that up halfway through, but it is, it is total comedy. Uh, I, I, I have favourite lines from that book. <laughs> As I turned to face him, I saw he had his erection firmly in his grasp. <laughs> that happened to me once in a greengrocer's. Not sexy. <laughs> <laughs> there's another bit, there's a bit where his hands glided over my breasts, kneading gently, taking no prisoners. It's <laughs> 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 written by John Watson. Mm. I mean, he takes no prisoners in the breast kneading department. <laughs> I can't believe you've memorised two quotes from me, Earl Any more, I should have two thought. Two quotes? Yeah. OK. <laughs> <laughs> No, we haven't got all night. They've all had their books panned by critics, except for David Cameron, whose book's been savaged before it's even published. In a review of Jacob Rees-Mogg's book in the Sunday Times, one critic asked, did Rees-Mogg really write this, or did he get the work experience boy to do it? <laughs> of course not, the work experience boy was up the chimney. <laughs> According to the Mail, E.L. James's latest erotic novel has been badly received, and the author has been subjected to a furious backlash. <laughs> Someone forgot the safe word. <laughs> <laughs> Time now. Definitely going to lose. <laughs> Why? I, I don't know the answers to anything. Lots of points available here. Oh, good. So I just got my teammate telling me you're definitely going to lose. <laughs> <laughs> like being Change UK. <laughs> <laughs> Time now for the missing words round, which this week features as its guest publication, Box and Fiddle. This is the magazine of the National Association of Accordion and Fiddle Clubs. <laughs> I'm assuming the Fiddle Club was keen on a merger as it was attracting the wrong kind of membership. <laughs> <on that. laughs> and we start with, woman takes day off work after what? Meeting with Sir Graham Brady. <laughs> More musical than that. More musical. Woman takes day off work after Andrew Lloyd Webber creates a musical about her. In her once what with a badger in what? Jarvis Conker... Conker? Uh, uh, son of William the Conker. <laughs> <laughs> I like the sound yeah. of him. Uh, Jarvis Conker once boogied with a badger in Belize. Uh, bonked a badger in Burma. <laughs> it's no way so exciting. Jarvis Conker once had a rave with a badger in a tunnel under the M25. <laughs> <laughs> this was back in the 90s when Jarvis Conker was, in his own words, in an altered state at a festival. <laughs> Here he is. I think the badger was worried it was going to catch TB off him. <laughs> Next, train company may cancel what after passengers what? Services after passengers insist on using them. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's close enough. Train company may cancel complimentary snacks in first class after passengers eat too many. So they were using the services. First class passengers have been eating too many biscuits and crisps on trains between Norwich and London. I mean, to be fair, that can be a three-day journey. <laughs> <laughs> Next. Woman discovered her dog has been secretly what with what? Running the Thames waterboard with the cat next door. <laughs> <laughs> Negotiating successfully with Michelle Barnier. <laughs> yes. Woman discovered that her dog has been secretly solving crimes with a group of cartoon teenagers. <laughs> <laughs> Woman discovered her dog has been secretly deleting her Facebook posts with its bum. <laughs> <laughs> And finally, what can be lonely but rewarding? Life outside the European Union. <laughs> <laughs> that won't go out. <laughs> <laughs> Setting up a one-person criminal organisation. <laughs> the answer is, fiddling solo can be lonely but rewarding. <laughs> <laughs> this is from Box and Fiddle, the only magazine where it's possible to find this utterly harmless, utterly innocent sentence. We did have a fiddler in the family, <laughs> my Uncle Donald. <laughs> <laughs> So, the final scores are Ian and Ahir, five, Paul and Jess, seven. Outrageous. 
And I leave you with news that after Tom Daly advertises for a new synchronised diving partner, there's not the quality of applicant that he hoped for. <laughs> ITV's new Disneyland-style theme park, there's disappointment when visitors are greeted by the characters of Ant and Deck. <laughs> and in Kensington, thanks to a special meeting of Beatles fans, we now know how many holes it takes to fill the Albert Hall. <laughs> Good night. Good night. And the topical comedy catch-up continues on BBC iPlayer with Ramesh and the Ultimate Focus Group taking apart the week's news. Watch the Ranga Nation now.